worker for uh, HLA lab. Uh, we facilitate almost 1,000 transplants per year at UCSF. Uh, so almost uh, 30 years living with HLA, so I, I um, probably know uh, a lot of uh, stuff which needs to be done. So, so, uh, so the HLA is a, is a big field, uh, comprising everything in one hour lecture is not possible. That's what I was talking to Srini. Uh, previously, but uh, let, let's begin. Then uh, we can we, we can continue uh, uh, in many lectures over the time. So I try to uh, uh, present uh, for forty minutes, then take rest of the time for the questions. Uh, so I, in this lecture, I'm going to just stay with the basics basics of transplantation immunology. Uh, then what are the basics of histocompatibility testing? So we do only three type of testing in HLA labs. So just do the typing for the matching. Uh, then uh, do antibody testing to, uh, uh, to identify whether the patient is sensitized to HLA uh, in previous more, more soft, um, um, uh, like transplantation and uh, pregnancies or transfusion sometimes, then ultimately uh, perform the donor-specific cross-matching. So these are the three testing over and over across the globe in HLA lab people are doing, but they may be using different technologies, but the ultimate goal is to assess is to compatibility uh, for clinical transplantation. So, uh, so it's, HLA is important, uh, no questions. So if you look at the graph survival, the kidney graph survival of uh, uh, 220,000, over 220,000 transplant from the collaborative transplant study. So every single mismatch, you see a drop in the graph survival. So obviously the, the, the HLA matching is critical. But it, uh, here they looked at only APDR, so not only in the European studies, but in US studies also, they always look EABDR because they never capture other HLA locus. Now they started to capturing across all nine loci, but now, but all the clinical data available so far is um, against this ABDR uh, three locus or six antigen matching. So in the next couple of slides, I'm, I'm going to show what is the extent of this diversity could be. So why we are just restricting only three antigens. So what is the, what, what we need to know beyond these three antigens. So if you look at the uh, HLA genes, so the major histocompatibility complex where the HLA genes are located, these are the class one genes, ABC, that encodes HLA, ABC antigens, and the class two genes, there's a group of three, two antigens like a DR, DQ, and DP. So the number I put underneath in blue indicates the unique HLA proteins identified in each locus. For example, here's the B locus. We have 483 unique HLA B proteins identified per this particular day, so November, 15th last year. So if I check now, it could be 5,000. So every time there is an increase in number of HLA proteins identified. So you see the numbers across in all loci. So uh, this, the number of genes I put here so is not constant. There are some variation, particularly uh, in the DRB genes. You know, some haplotypes can have multiple or more than one DRB genes that comes with a different name. So these are the individual chromosomes. So there are, if you talk, take hundreds of individuals and look at this major histocompatibility complex, you can see the four type of uh, haplotypes or major histocompatibility complex uh, gene set that differs in the gene content. So we have two chromosomes from one from father, one from mother. Then, then we will have two of these. So combination either the same haplotypes or the combination of any, either uh, either two haplotypes. So that produce uh, a diversity uh, in just having a number of DRB genes. So the next slide, I'm going to explain how that looks like in just taking two individuals. So like here, 
uh, one individual, another individual. So here's the DRB gene uh, having only one DRB gene, but this individual having additional DRB gene in different chromosomes. So that is DRB4, DRB5. So just looking at the DRB genes, this individual having four DRB genes, this individual having two DR, DRB genes, okay? So now each gene is polymorphic at the sequence level or at the protein level. So if you consider them, so look at this individual is a homozygous, looks very similar at the allelic level in across all the HLA loci, but here's opposite. Each allele is very unique. So in this case, this individual can express unique HLA proteins, either coming from this loci or this allele. So same proteins, B35. So 1B, 1C, 1A, because the sequences are very similar at both locus. So and then the DR, the B, the D, DRB, the, the, the beta chain, the B chain encodes the beta chain and the A chain encodes the alpha chain, the combination forming the heterodimer expressing one DR molecules. Because of the gene uh, sequence are same, it pro produce only one DR. Similarly, one DQ, one DP. But here, because of the allelic polymorphism, this individual can express two B, two Cs, and two As. And the DRs, you have so many, there are four uh, DRB genes, so you end up expressing four different uh, DRB uh, molecules. So the DQs, a little different. So the DR, the DRA gene is identical almost everyone in two polymorphism identified in the human population. 99% of them carrying one the one variant so that everyone has almost the same thing. So we don't even type them for each other compatibility purpose. So uh, this, 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 uh, this alpha chain can be encoded from either one of these alleles. So you have four, but in DQ, both D, DQ alpha are polymorphic. So you can, you can see a protein coming from this combination, alpha beta, then another protein from this combination, then the trans combination from here to here and here to here. So you express four different DQs. The DP also very similar to DQ alpha. So you express four different DQs. So just looking at the number of HLA proteins, you have one individual can have 18 distinct HLA molecules they express, and compared to another individuals carrying just expressing only six HLA molecules, just number of HLA itself, this kind of diversity you can see, see within the families. One sibling can have very minimal HLA proteins, other sibling can have uh, more HLA protein. So this is uh, very important. So this may be uh, an advantage if you can express a lot of HLA, the individual is having advantage to present variety of pathogenic peptides to immune system. So they can be a tolerant to infection compared to the individuals expressing only limited HLA proteins. But when it comes to the transplantation purpose, it creates a lot of issues. So uh, moving to the next basic immunology and transplantation immunology, uh, we, you know, we, we, we don't do much immunology. We are, not, we are not doing transplantation based on the immunology com compatibilities. So unfortunately, the transplantation occurs based on whatever the drugs that we have, particularly we have developed from the autoimmune world. So uh, for example, if an, an individual, this recipient, the patient are uh, received and kidney transplantation from an HLA mismatch uh, individuals, the recipient immune system rejects the kidney. So the recipient immune system, the cellular immune system, as well as the humoral or antibody mediated system reject the kidney. But we have a lot of drugs developed from the autoimmune world uh, to deplete any of these particular cells. So we have uh, anti-thymoglobulin, so that can deplete T cell and NK cell population, anti-CD3 that can selectively deplete our T cells, or anti-CD25 that can deplete activated T cells, um, anti-CD52 or CAMPA that can deplete all mature cells, 
and we have CD20 or toxin that selectively duplicate B cells. So based on the need, we can uh, use these drugs, take out the cellular component of the immune system. Then you put the kidney, then give the patients uh, the immunosuppressive drugs every day. So uh, as long as the patient takes this immunosuppressive drugs every day, the kidney stays there for six to uh, nine years, no problem. So if they don't take Im immunosuppression, particularly it's very common in pediatric patients or adolescent patients, so they uh, develop antibodies or they develop rejection, in the cellular or antibody mediated rejection. Uh, so, but uh, there are some patients, around 30% of the patients uh, make antibodies uh, to HLA molecule because prior sensitization to HLA uh, due to prior transplantation or pregnancy or transfusions. So these antibodies are made by plasma cells, which are hidden in the bone marrow. So we don't have any specific drug to deplete uh, plasma cells. So we have some temporary solution to remove the antibodies by plasma phoresis or plasma exchange, or just blocking IV uh, antibodies in non-specific manners using IVIG. So that's kind of magic drug used in transplantation as well as autoimmune diseases without any specificity, but uh, fortunately it works because we don't have any specific drugs. Then anti-complement um, inhibitory factors. Uh, so this is very expensive drug. It can inhibit complement in temporary fashion. So you can save the organ if the patient shows hyperacute rejection type of rejection. But the best um, way that we can avoid this antibody uh, mediated rejection is identification of these antibodies and avoid them. So we avoid those uh, uh, targets. Um, uh, so you select a compatible uh, donor. So that's, that's what we, we, we can do it to avoid any uh, potential rejection. So in the last slides, I and in the basic, I want to go through uh, because we know a lot of the T cells. We don't need to understand the T cell because we have the drugs to deplete the uh, deplete out. There are many drugs to suppress the immune responses. So there are clinical practice, but um, in understanding uh, the uh, antibodies, so that's more critical uh, aspect or, or more hot topic in transplantation immunology. Still, we are working on understanding how to measure the circulating antibodies, but we have no drugs or we have no much understanding how to control the production of antibody, uh, HLA antibody productions. So what I'm, what I'm showing here in this slide is the, the B cells, um, uh, the, uh, the naive B cells, uh, it is in the bone marrow that get into the secondary lymphoid tissues uh, or lymphoid organs that so they get matured, where it is waiting for um, uh, yeah, help from the T cells. The T cells that is coming from the organ that is uh, yeah, uh, uh, triggered by the press, uh, antigens so in, in transplant setting. So the antigen presenting cells coming from your transplant organ can trigger uh, the T cells, particularly the T helper cells, uh, through this MSC interaction. Then these helper cells will help the B cells, which uh, will be uh, become a mature memory cells get into the circulation. Your subset of memory cells can uh, get into the bone marrow, then uh, it matures into the plasma cells where uh, which which produced um, antibodies. So if these antibodies are specific to donor HLA antigen that binds to the donor HLA antigens in a specific manner, then it triggers a cascade of cellular and humoral rejections in using different mechanisms. The primary one is it, this antibody uh, can bind to the complement factor that can trigger a cascade of uh, uh, lytic activation so that can reject the organ. Or the antibodies can also bind to the cellular compositions, particularly the natural killer cells using this FC receptors. Then it triggers the cytotoxic activity or antibody dependent cell cytotoxic activity, uh, again, killing the organ. Or uh, it can uh, uh, bind to the uh, antigen presenting cells, it can engulf this uh, 
antigen so that can uh, present in an indirect manner uh, back to the uh, helper T cells in the uh, secondary lymph node organ as well as in the periphery. So bottom line is it triggers the HLA proteins. Any mismatch here um, uh, can, or the antibody uh, production against the mismatch antigen can enhance the anti uh, autoimmune response and reject the organs. So there are many drugs also, as we talked about the plasmos, plasmophoresis, it removes our HLA antibodies in non-specific manner or uh, using IVIG, again, it blocks the antibodies uh, in non-specific manner and in an idiotypic uh, way. Then retoxin uh, uh, that can selectively deplete uh, the B cells, but uh, it doesn't deplete uh, the, mem the plasma cells because the plasma cells doesn't express um, uh, CD20. Uh, so uh, still the antibody can be produced, but you can avoid uh, some new, the new uh, response, new antibody response by using CD20 antibodies. Then botuzumab uh, that can destroy uh, the plasma cells or activating uh, cells of any type. Uh, so, uh, but uh, it has a lot of lethal effect. Uh, so a lot of um, centers stop using that. Then we have anti-CD uh, campath. Uh, so that depletes all the immune cells. Again, it's very lethal because you deplete all the lymphocytes and it is uh, it doesn't come back uh, in six months. So you had patients are exposed to a lot of infections and so on. And we have eclusimab or complement inhibitory factors, uh, so that can inhibit uh, complement activity. So uh, going to the uh, HLA uh, typing, so we have so many uh, methods available. Um, uh, it has been in practice, you know, we started with the serological typing methods. I'm not going to walk through each one. Uh, so then uh, once the PCR is invented, people develop uh, uh, gene-specific or allele-specific amplification. You amplify the gene and uh, run it on the gel and identify HLA alleles. Then they later develop uh, your dot blot or blot dot methods. Um, uh, it's kind of handling high volume testing, you know, the registry typing was typed by using this blot, uh, dot blot methods in one time point. Then the reverse dot, uh, reverse blot just, uh, you, you blot the probe on the membrane and the hybridist with an amplified DNA. Uh, so it's all great typing, but recently, um, recently means around 15 years back, uh, so using uh, uh, the reverse blot techniques, they applied on the Luminex uh, method. So they take the Luminex beads and apply the probes and it's kind of more easier method. Uh, many labs in uh, uh, US and uh, uh, other part of the uh, globe are using this method. Then uh, this is most uh, recent methods, very similar to the SSP method, but they put it on the real time PCR. So it takes, uh, very quick, it's like a 90 minutes you can get the typing. So many labs, almost all labs in the US are that use the disease donor typing use this method because it's very simple and straightforward. It involves very uh, minimal interpretations. But more recently, so the next generation, so we use these two methods in the labs. Uh, so we use the SSO method type the patients for the solid organ. Then we use the real-time uh, PCR for deceased on a typing. So uh, the NGS method uh, is uh, broadly used. Uh, it's, it's very attractive methods. It's simple. It covers most of the uh, regions. Um, um, uh, uh, it's, it's, a, it's the ultimate method. So you get the allele level sequence. And more recently, people introduced the long, I mean, so, so far is all the commercial NGS methods are the long range PCR methods, but that comes with a lot of artifact and the allelic dropout. But people recently introduced, uh, there's no use in long range PCRs. Take the DNA, it's called capture methods. You take the DNA, uh, make them into small fragments and capture the HLA genes using specific HLA specific probes, which is conjugated or tagged with your, uh, uh, your probe, um, uh, 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 abidin, 
uh, molecules which can be captured with the magnetic beads so that you can pull this HLA uh, uh, genes and you sequence them using the next generation sequencing. So this is, uh, this is, this has been commercialized. We have been using this in our bone marrow transplant world. And now we are um, uh, adapting using this automation so that can handle thousands of samples. Um, uh, so we can, uh, the, the, the long-term goal is, it's not even long-term, so maybe in six months, we are hoping to run every single DNA that comes into our lab for either bone marrow or solid organ transplant, just run in one platform. So that's the next generation sequencing. Uh, so uh, making one flow HL, uh, HLA typing is very cost effective. It's very, uh, uh, because it's a less um, uh, technology time involved. Um, uh, you, you, you buy a reagent from one company in mass level then you can save a lot of money. So that's the goal. So we're hoping to implement uh, in six months. So it has a lot of advantage, no PCR along with is PCR needed, that means no artifact involved. It's, uh, it's allele coverage is great. Uh, we never found any allelic dropouts. We did have uh, over 2000 uh, DNA testing uh, with kind of uh, simultaneous uh, methods using SSO as well as NGS. NGS. Uh, the capture in GS, we never found any dropout. So, uh, so bottom line is is great. So putting them in uh, both BMT and solid organ work on the same workflow uh, will will save a lot of our time and cost. And also, we can report uh, the report within two days. Uh, so that's going to be great. So in terms of uh, uh, organ uh, uh, methodologies, uh, uh, the matching terminologies, what I'm showing here are uh, uh, some examples, like this, the recipient typing, ABC, ABDR, just for the educational purpose, I stay with very simplicity. So ABC, ABDR, then the donor typing having the same profile. So we call them as HLA, identical donor. Then the second scenario is the A locus is same, uh, same antigen, A1, A1, homozygous, not like here, A3, A3, or not like the recipients. It is different, but there is no uh, different antigens in the donor, so that is different from recipients, so there is no mismatch. So we call them zero mismatch. So in the third scenario, so you see this almost like all city in all three, A, B, and C. So here still there is no mismatch um, in the in the recipient, in the donor side. So we still call them zero, zero mismatch. So if you if it is an opposite, if the recipient become donor and the donor become recipient, that's a different story. So there will be a three antigen mismatch. Then scenario four, uh, that's a one antigen mismatch, or we call the one DR mismatch. Here's the three antigen mismatch, and here's all the six antigen mismatch. Again, just looking at three antigens, it can go up to 18 HLA antigen mismatch. So the more mismatches are the worst mismatch. So we always look for uh, the better uh, match if possible. So uh, if you look at the families, uh, because we do uh, a lot of living donor transplantations, um, so the HLA proteins or HLA genes are segregated independently as the independent chromosomes in the, in the gametes. So the random um, association of uh, paternal maternal gametes uh, produce uh, uh, children with a different combination of haplotypes. So like here's a four, possible way of combinations. So uh, here, uh, if, the, if, the, if, the, if the patient have another child, so that child is going to be identical to one of these children. So for example, here, so it's same haplotypes, uh, children, child one and child five is carrying. Uh, so that means you're finding uh, a HLA compatible donor within the family is there's a 25% chances. Uh, so uh, then uh, this child uh, is uh, child B, uh, four is completely a Chile mismatch because they uh, segregate uh, haplotypes uh, from father and mother, very different from what the children, child A uh, receives. Uh, these two children, child two and child three are haplomatch, uh, having one chromosome uh, match with the child A. 
uh, uh, the father uh, is not always a great donor to the mother because father, uh, the mother is sensitized by father HLA during pregnancies. So even you don't see in antibodies, uh, so you always have an immunizations against the father in mother's uh, body. So if mother develops some antibodies, for example, HLA B8 against this uh, particular antigen, then uh, within the family, so you eliminate a lot of donors who carries uh, all the B8 antigens. If the patient, if the mother makes more antibodies like additional BR4, uh, you exclude um, other children as well as based on because both uh, these this, this, this antibodies are against uh, the antigens in both haplotypes, uh, paternal haplotypes. So you'll be uh, excluding uh, all, the, all the children. So uh, this can be done in uh, uh, random populations uh, in, in, in unrelated donors on deceased donor transplantations. So we have the system in, uh, in US. So uh, we call them unacceptable antigen testing. If your patient comes in, you measure HLA antibodies. If the patient has EA2 antibodies, you enter into the UNO systems. So the UNO's computer has all the donor HLA um, typing information, so done in the past 10 years, like over 10,000 or 12,000, maybe now it's 20,000 donors. So they have the HLA typing information here in their computer. So when you tell your patient, uh, the uh, computer, the patient has A2 antibodies, so it, it excludes, the computer excludes all the donors carrying HLA A2. So that gives you a percentage of the panel. So how many individuals within this panel carrying A2, that gives you a percentage, is 48%. It is called CPRA or calculated panel reactive antibody. So if the patient make HLA and A2 antibodies, 48% of the um, uh, uh, donors in the in, in deceased donor population will be excluded. The patient make more antibodies like DR4, additional donors who has DR4 will be excluded. So that will add more CPRA. So more antibodies, uh, more uh, donors will be excluded. So this is only three antibodies. Uh, if the patient has 76% of the uh, UNOS donors or, or, or unrelated donors will be excluded. So imagine a lot of patients making more antibodies. So that's, that's what a lot of patients become 100% CPRs. When 100% means, so they are high, loaded with many, many uh, HLA antibodies. So this can be uh, done in your computer program. So that's uh, uh, in, in the UNOS. Uh, so here is a, uh, 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 if you open your patient file, so you get the screen, then you tell the computer, this patient, my patient has A2 antibodies that immediately give you a percentage of CPRA. Uh, then you can leave it um, uh, blocking those uh, A2 antigens in the patient file. So when the match run comes, when the deceased donor available in the country, when they do a location, the, all the A2 positive donors will be excluded so that we will get a donor that is compatible to the patient. So this kind of uh, type of uh, calculations or computing can be done uh, in Indian population, but using uh, Indian HLA uh, frequencies. So then HLA antibody testing, the second uh, topic. So we know the HLA antibodies are detrimental, whether it is preformed or de novo, but the de novo antibody production uh, is more detrimental to against the graph. Uh, so uh, so we, we need to be uh, careful. So we need to be, uh, be so we, we don't know how to avoid it. So more monitoring, more matching is critical uh, to make sure uh, the de novo antibodies are not developed. So in terms of methodology, we have several methods uh, uh, detecting HLA antibodies. Uh, I don't think anyone using serological methods in this country uh, or um, many labs in around the globe, uh, but uh, uh, there are three uh, solid phase uh, methods are available. Um, so here it is the mixed beads. Um, uh, here you, you take like a, HLA proteins from 
10 different individuals carrying a uh, very unique HLA pattern, you harvest those HLA proteins and conjugate on the luminex beads. So when you use these mixed beads, you can have your test result called positive or negative. A patient has antibodies or no antibodies. So this is very simple uh, testing. It's cheapest testing, but uh, the sensitivity is low. So 25% of the time, you can miss, um, uh, it, it produced the false and negative results. So, you know, see so if you have your low antibodies, you cannot detect by this uh, uh, insensitive method. Then the second method is a multi-antigen bead. Uh, it's like a synthetic uh, cell. So you isolate HLA protein one individuals and conjugate on your single bead. So you can get like a hundreds of beads uh, carrying HLA proteins. Uh, from 100 different individuals. So pulling them using this as the detection reagents, you can identify whether the patient have any antibodies. If they have some level of specificities, we can identify. <coughs> but because of the uh, HLA protein cross-reactivity, it is very hard sometime what type of HLA antibody the patient makes. It is a little expensive, but it's not a much, um, uh, yeah, it, it's, it's, it is uh, cheaper than uh, the next methods, that's the single antigen beads. The single antigen beads is the ultimate technology. So uh, almost all labs in the US and many labs in, uh, in other part of the world are using it. Um, because it, the, the bead carries a unique protein um, uh, made by the recombinant uh, method. So it doesn't cause any cross reactivity. It comes with the different uh, uh, challenges, but uh, generally uh, this is the ultimate methods, the most sensitive methods uh, people use to detect HLA antibodies. So we, so we, this, we use um, in our lab as a primary HLA antibody detection method. So when you do the HLA antibody testing, there are some uh, 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 some uh, standards needs to be covered. For example, uh, you cannot just depend on one uh, antibody uh, method. So I will show you some example. Uh, if you depend on one HLA antibody method or one vendor product, you can be completely wrong. So I will I have an example. So you always have your secondary method when you, when ambiguity arises, when questionable uh, pattern arises, uh, you can use that secondary method to confirm the antibody profile. Then uh, the serum uh, uh, can have a lot of inhibitory factors like IgM or complement that can block um, the solid phase assay. So you can have, you can, you can get uh, false uh, negative results. So what we do, uh, almost all labs do, they uh, use some pretreatment, serum pretreatment. So we use di DTT. Uh, so, uh, so this depletes all IgM antibodies as well as complement factors we get so that we can get more sensitive values uh, in HLA antibody production or uh, uh, testing. Then the last thing is um, uh, the YMFI can be is a very sensitive method, the single antigen method. So the YMFI can fluctuate highly. So I will walk through some of the slides, some of the uh, um, uh, um, methods that we use, how to keep uh, this MFI variation uh, simple. So we use automation, basically. I will, I'll show you some of them. So this is, uh, in this slide I'm showing, um, here's a, uh, serum tested by one vendor. So you can see a lot of C locus antibodies, very high MFI. Uh, so some of them are 15,000 MFI. Uh, so if you count the, uh, if you consider these antibodies, the CPR is 86%. When you take the same serum, run it on another vendor, it is, uh, is, is completely uh, negative. So you see the MFI is only uh, 1,200 here. So uh, this is this is twelve thousand versus twelve hundred. Um, so uh, this can become so. You need to be very careful. So that 
that comes with the practice, um, how many uh, serum you use, uh, how many uh, serum you test it. Uh, so it depends on the Chile laboratory. So, uh, so I want to walk through some basics here. So I think um, uh, we don't have much time. Let's see, um, we'll go through very quickly. So when you look at all the polymorphism of HLA proteins, I'm, what I'm selecting, so in here is the pile up of some represented A, B, and C uh, sequences uh, that encodes this antigen uh, binding domain, alpha one and alpha two, where, where most of the polymorphisms are segregated. So here is um, um, most of the, this, the first one is the reference sequence. Uh, so any dot indicates the identity to the reference sequence. So you see the polymorphisms are very limited and most of the polymorphisms are shared between uh, multiple HLA -LS. There's not much unique polymorphism like a G here, very unique. So you don't see many of these. So this kind of network polymorphism create challenges in HLA labs. So if you take all this and create in, in envision into, into a three dimensional structures, you see structurally very similar, it's all the same, but only that where the polymorphisms are, unique polymorphisms, you have this kind of motif where this antibody bind. So it is called epitope. So these are called private epitope because each HLA comes with a unique uh, set of amino acid sequence. But some uh, motif can be shared, so like these are called public epitopes shared by multiple HLA proteins. So if the patient make antibodies against this triangle epitopes, which is shared all the way by these five HLA proteins, so that antibody binds to um, all these HLA proteins. So we don't have any specific nomenclature to call this antibodies. It's all antibodies binds to one specific motif, identical to naturally sequence, but the proteins are very different. So we call these antibodies A2, 68, 69, 57, and 58. Actually, this is one antibodies. Okay. So this is, uh, this is the big challenge in HLA field. So uh, for uh, that means so there's no one HLA, one antibody. So you always have um, an antibody that reacts or that binds to multiple HLA proteins. That means uh, you can have one HLA bind to multiple HLA antibodies. Um, so it, it is going to get complex. Huh? So there is no, so we are talking about the antigen is a different name, but we don't have an antibody name. So we are using, we are calling this antibody using an antigen name. So that's, that's what the complexity raises. So in the next, uh, uh, in reality, the, 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 the rule is no one makes antibodies to self HLA. So that's a good thing. No. So we need to know what is the patient HLA typing to rule out any, any background reactivity. So uh, if the patient uh, with this hap type HLA type receive a kidney transplant with a only one mismatch antigen, only A2, you can think over the time the, the patient develop antibodies to HLA A2. Actually, he develops more antibodies because of the shared HLA uh, antigens. So there's all the HLA molecules having one epitope. So the antibody, HLA A2 antibody binds to all these uh, molecules. So these are called cross-reactive groups. So we have 22 distinct cross-reactive groups uh, have been characterized. So when we do the antibody analysis, we always look for the cross-reactive group. So when antibody means it should be reacting to multiple HLA proteins. We never see any specific one antigen, one uh, antibody reactions. So, uh, so that uh, some of these uh, epitopes uh, are, are the cross-reactive groups are uh, having high CPR value. That means the frequency in the population is high. For example, BW6, 85% of the population carrying BW6. So when it comes to the reality in clinical practice, so this is the woman uh, having, uh, this is her uh, type, BW4 homozygous. 
um, her husband is BW6 and a couple of, after a couple of pregnancy, she can make antibodies against the BW6, which is present in all these HLA proteins. So just one antibody can bind to all this. So that, that we call this, we, we don't call BW6 antibody, we call antibodies to BW7, B, uh, B7, B8, all this bunch of molecules. That's why the CPR is much higher. So one antibody can exclude 85% of the donors. So, uh, so always is easy uh, when you do the single antigen, see if you see this bar and uh, reactivity, you can uh, call them, but sometimes it's not the reality. It can be like a low, weak reactivity, but once it is assembled, uh, then you need to identify there is some antibodies uh, uh, in, the, in, the, in the patient. So that can uh, trigger an immune response, memory uh, response if you bring a kidney with a BW6. So we are not just looking at the MFI, we look for the pattern. So that's what we give the primary MSI. So here we call this BW6 antibodies, we exclude any donor with BW6. So uh, uh, the MFIs are highly fluctuating. Um, uh, uh, so uh, we use uh, automations that comes with the um, uh, uh, pipetting, uh, centrifugation, PCR machines, uh, and, uh, and even Luminex. It's just all you set up the assays and you fit it in the machine, so then that handles. So using this kind of automation, we minimize um, the MFI variations, but still uh, there, there's a, the CV is like a 8.5%. So there's a changes can be like a 2000 plus or minus. So these are the data that we use a single serum, your control serum in every time we run the single antigen antibody assays. If you capture those MFI of those standard beads, you can see for uh, follow fight for, for your one year, you can see up and down. So you see, so you see this uh, two to 3000 uh, uh, MFI variations. So even we use, um, we, we use the um, uh, automation. Uh, if you use the manual methods, uh, there will be a lot of changes. We don't even capture those data. We don't even uh, do uh, manual methods. So you can see some bits are a big difference here so because this is when we, when we uh, use a new lot of reagents, uh, we see very different patterns with uh, some uh, HLA uh, molecules. So these are, this kind of quality control needs to be done uh, within the HLA lab, make sure the reagents are uh, behaving, the new reagents they buy are behaving very similar to what it's supposed to be. So the, another question is uh, how uh, stable this HLA antibodies are. So if you look at the patients, so the, what I'm showing is the six different patients looking at different uh, time points over the years, a couple of years, you can see it's a big change. There's some antibodies going down, some coming up. Uh, so there's uh, almost all patients so that we looked at, um, uh, you see there's no antibody stay stable. So it's constantly changing. But uh, these, are, these are like a two or three years follow-up. If you look at very short time, within six months, not big change. Um, uh, there, there may be some MFI change, but still uh, it remains within the same range. So uh, what it tells um, how often one has to screen for HLA antibodies when the patient is waiting for kidney transplantations, maybe uh, three months uh, is good enough. So that's what we are using in our center. Then you probably know in a lot of meetings, um, uh, so we have uh, uh, people talk about the complement binding antibodies like C1Q, C3D uh, is, is, uh, is nothing very specific. It is all associated with the high MFI. If you see an antibody over 5,000 MFI, that start uh, uh, providing positivity on C3D or C1Q assays. So anything less than 5,000 MFI, uh, those assays become negative. So it is not complement and binding antibody, it is purely correlated with the donor-specific antibodies. 
So uh, the next one is the cross match. I think I am uh, uh, way um, away from my timeline. Uh, uh, Dr. Srini, uh, do you want to stop here, take some questions? We can do this another day, cross match. What do you think? Yeah, maybe another uh, five minutes, if you would oh, like okay. to. Oh, sure, okay, no, no problem. Five minutes, uh, five minutes. We take the questions. Okay, perfect. So we, we can even go after one hour, correct? So yeah, so we'll uh, so we'll, I'll, I'll take five minutes to complete this cross match. So uh, in the industry, people use many many type of cross match. So the T cell cross match, B cell, you know, all type of cross match. But each one comes with the different goals. Um, so uh, the most uh, uh, the, the the first cross match was developed by Paul Terasaki. Uh, you know, here that's the complement dependent cytoxy methods. I think people still are using it. Uh, in US, we don't use this method. Uh, we recently, we, maybe like three years back, you know, uh, Paul has to stop using this cross match methods because it comes with a lot of challenges. Uh, so uh, here, uh, Paul Terasaki used this donor cells and the recipient samples. Uh, he took the cell, uh, isolated the cells from the lip, uh, uh, donor samples. Uh, then he mixed with the uh, recipient serum. If any antibody is specific to the donor's HLA antigen, it binds. Then after 30 minutes, he added the complement. Uh, if the antibody binds, the complement binds to its antigen antibody complex. Then it, it, it creates a, uh, uh, it, it disturbs the membrane. Then he added the dye, which can distinguish red cells and the light cells. So uh, the red cells means uh, the complement, the antibodies are present, the donor specific antibodies are present, so don't do the, the cross match is positive, so don't do the transplant. Uh, if the cells doesn't die, it is a negative cross match, so the transplantation can be done. So here's the tricky part, uh, you need to isolate T cells and B cells because the T cell express only actually class one molecules and the B cell express class one, class two. If you don't isolate the T cells and use the entire uh, uh, blood cells, the lymphocytes, uh, uh, you, 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 were, you are not detecting the presence of the class two antibodies. You, you end up with a false positive reactivity. So using this uh, simple method of uh, 55 years back, uh, uh, Paul Terasaki uh, used this um, uh, retrospective study. So he took 225 transplant done based on the cross match, the, all the positive uh, cross match um, uh, experience, the hyperacute or accelerated antibody media rejection, then uh, negative cross match uh, transplant uh, state well. But the problem is uh, these two numbers, so the sensitivity and specificities and issues. Then uh, people uh, try to refine these methods by, uh, if you look at the uh, cells, it's not only expressing HLA protein, the cell express other targets like a non-HLA proteins. Then if you look at the serum, it's not only carrying only HLA antibodies, it can carry other antibodies, pathogenic antibodies, um, uh, or IgM antibodies. So people try to simply uh, deplete the IgM antibodies, enhance the sensitivity by using DTT treatment, or uh, 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 to enhance the sensitivity, simply added the um, uh, antibodies against uh, HLA antibodies. It is called anti-human uh, globulin antibodies uh, so that can enhance the sensitivity then or simply extend this incubation antigen antibody incubations. But it's all uh, helped little but still the pulse positivity uh, reactivity was a problem. So that people develop the flow cytometry cross match. Uh, so the requirement is very similar. Here you isolate the uh, lymphocytes. You don't need to isolate T and B cells because the flow cytometry has the ability to distinguish the T and B cells using uh, cell surface markers. So you, you take the uh, lymphocytes, then uh, you mix with the recipient serum. If the patient has antibodies against the mismatch HLA that binds, then you add the secondary antibodies, which is conjugated with the fluorochrome. Then you measure on the flow cytometry and compare with the negative control serum. Uh, 
So the negative control serum gives you a peak uh, for the T cells and B cell populations. Then when you compare with the patients, the peak can be um, uh, sifted. Uh, then when you compare with the negative peak, you can, you can make how many channels sift uh, uh, each T cell and B cell uh, sifter. So that gives you a quantitative value. So taking out this uh, control values, you, you can have a positive cross match or negative cross match and how much uh, median channel sifts. It's kind of quantitative way of assessing um, uh, cross match. So it's more sensitive methods. Um, um, again, uh, it has a lot of challenges. If the patient has some therapeutic antibodies like rituxin, because a lot of autoimmune patients uh, receive uh, retoxins. So those uh, antibodies can bind to the B cells uh, on and CD20 that can create false positive uh, reactivity. Or these antibodies also can uh, bind to the FC receptor. So uh, that also gives some background. So what we do, you can remove this uh, anti-CD20 as well as uh, FC receptor using pronase uh, enzymatic digestions. So that can give uh, more uh, clear uh, 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 cross match, B cell cross match uh, test results. So many centers, almost all centers use that as a standard of practice. But still, uh, the flow cross match is a problematic. It's, it's not perfect. So I'm going to show why. So when you look at the correlation between single antigen MFI and the cross match trends, um, uh, it, it, it's a lot of concern as emerging. So what I'm showing here, uh, the T cell cross match. T cell doesn't come, uh, doesn't produce any backgrounds. Very clean cross match. So, you, so what I'm showing here is the strength of T cell cross match in terms of median channel saved, and and uh, and uh, the strength of single donor specific class one antibodies. So, so we selectively perform this assist, taking a cross match, doing a cross match, each dot is a cross match, showing hitting a yes, unique or a single HLA class one donor specific antibodies. So here's the, the color code stands for the ABC. You can see the blue and red, some correlations, the odd value should be one for perfect correlations, but the A is 0.72, it's closer to one, but it's not perfect. Um, then red, some correlation, but look at the C, uh, there's no correlation at all. So you can see 20,000 MFI, DSA, C locus DSA, the cross match can be completely negative. So this is the 50 median channel set. So, um, so that's the, that's the problem. So you need to make sure you need to understand if, the, if you see the antibody, strong antibodies in, in solid phase assay, uh, you should not stop transplanting the patient. So you need to make sure whether this antibody binds to the cells. So that's why the flow cytometry cross match is very critical. So when you look at the B cell similar way, uh, there's no correlation at all uh, across AB, uh, across DR and DQ, DP. So you see this is less than 0.5. So, so some antibodies like some DR or DQ and DP can be 20,000 MFI completely negative. It doesn't bind to the cells. As long as the antibody doesn't bind to the cells, it is okay to transplant because it's not causing rejection. So the most, the most sensitive methods are, is, is the virtual cross match because you can you, you have a lot of flexibility there. So you don't need any of this um, uh, 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 equipment. You don't need any um, flow cross match. You don't, even you don't need a lot of samples. All you need some buckle swab to get the DNA, get the typing, then antibodies by single antigen assays. Uh, if you know the antibodies, for example, a patient make A2 antibodies, the typing is here that carries the A2, the donor typing, then you know uh, there is a donor specific antibody. And you know how much antibody the patient has in terms of MFI. So you can literally predict uh, the, as the, the, the compatibility or uh, uh, the risk, as a risk of the uh, transplant outcome. So the virtual cross match is an assessment of uh, immunologic compatibility based on the patient alloantibody profile compared to the donor sister compatibility antigens. It is not equivalent to predicting uh, your physical cross match. It's just immunological compatibility assessment. 
So 75% uh, of our transplant, kidney transplant, occur in, uh, uh, in my center is done based on the virtual cross match. So we look at the data, the graph survival data. So we did almost 2,000 transplant, um, the virtual cross match based transplant, almost 1,000 transplants are done. Then uh, uh, that's, the, that's the blue line. Then the black is the physical cross match disease donors. So the both are disease donors. You can see either you do the virtual cross match based kidney transplant. This is disease donor kidney transplant or physical cross match transplant, the survival, uh, you, you don't see any difference. The red line is the living donor kidney transplants. Of course, that has a lot of advantages because of more matches, uh, less cold ischemic time, the age of the donors are uh, low and the diabetes rate is low. So it has a lot of advantage, so it stands alone. So in the bottom line in the end, hi, this is the summary slides. So whatever testing you use it, you know, so if you have uh, antibodies, CDC cross match positive, flow cross match positive, you know, so you see the hyperacute rejection. So we don't see this because many centers or oh, it's, it's like CDC cross match become very standard. We, we, don't, we don't see this once we, we, we remove it. But uh, sometimes uh, if the flow cross match, some center uh, transplant with the flow cross match positive and more DSA positive, then that creates more uh, hyperacute or acute rejection, accelerated antibody mediated rejection. Then uh, chronic uh, mediate chronic rejection can be possible when you transplant with a low level of DSA. But uh, remember, if the patient, we may not see any antibodies in the circulation, cross match can be negative, uh, DSA can be negative, but uh, people can make uh, HLA antibodies uh, because of memory response, because of previous uh, exposure to the HLA proteins or uh, de novo antibody synthesized. So I will stop here uh, taking any questions. Sorry, I went um, across my time. Thanks, uh, Raj. Uh, can you probably remove the screen sharing? Yeah, sure. Uh, I'll stop. Yep. Yeah. Good. Great. Thanks. Thanks a lot uh, for walking us through. Uh, if you have any questions, please unmute yourself and then you could ask the questions. Maybe uh, I, I will start off uh, with my, uh, my question uh, based on the conversations that you have had. Uh, if we have, uh, my understanding is that uh, the best way to move forward will be doing uh, uh, a single antigen bead assay and then uh, HLA typing and move forward with the virtual cross match to save time and possibly save samples uh, volume that is required. Is that right? Uh, absolutely. It saves time. So that's the patient care. So we, we, so you, you, if, you, if you know that there's no donor-specific antibodies against that particular donor, uh, you, you don't need any testing. You don't need your blood samples. You don't need wait to wait wait for receiving the blood samples. You don't need to bring your people to the lab. Um, uh, then the kidney can directly go to the OR uh, from anywhere, uh, uh, not from the same city. So it, it's a it's a great um, uh, way of doing transplantations. Uh, you, you know, so we, we need we don't need to put the kidney on ice. Okay. Sounds interesting. Is there any other questions? I saw in the chat box, chat or question okay. box. For which subset of recipients we must mandate SBA? That Dr. Isha Tiwari. For which subset of recipients we must mandate SBA? Uh, yeah, that's the, I think that's the, Good question. So um, here in uh, in in our practice, we do single antigen on every individuals. Uh, we don't need to do that, you know, because it's so expensive. So uh, in your case, uh, maybe uh, you can do um, uh, either screening, you know, so low cost uh, testing, uh, like it costs like a twenty five dollars something. So 
So you can do screen, then if it is positive, then you do the single antigen testing. So that's also expensive because 70% of the patients do not make antibodies. So you can even strategize, you know, so who makes antibodies are the pregnant woman or a retransplant candidate or the patient uh, got many transfusion, blood transfusions. So if you identify as like a man, uh, never had any uh, surgery because there's no transfusions, those are like uh, 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 candidates, they, they don't see any, they don't make any HLA antibodies. But if you use single antigen, there are some uh, overreactivity, so false positivity. So you end up assigning those antibodies, but those are not real antibodies. So, um, if, so uh, single antigen, maybe you can start for the woman with, all the women can go with the single antigen testing. All, all the retransplant candidates can be done in the single antigen testing. That's what simple thing. Thank you. Okay. Uh, the other thing you were talking about the CPRA uh, and uh, unfortunately the HLA frequencies are completely different in Indian subset. Uh, unlike what you have in the Caucasian population for V, you have a CPRA calculator. This has been a challenge. And for those who are uh, uh, there today and listening, I think uh, probably in the next couple of weeks, you will have an Indian CPRA calculator based on something like about 250,000 South Asian HLA typing. So we are hoping that we'll be able to launch it in the next few weeks. Thanks to some good collaborative work with some of our friends in US. Absolutely, yeah. It's, it's, a, it's a challenging, it's a, it's a, it's a, we, we have a lot of different populations, so their frequencies are different, but it's going to be interesting. So you need to start with that. Let's see how it goes. Yeah. <laughs> but but how do you, how are you going to use it in national levels? So you, you've got, you know, that, that's the question. Um, I, I think it needs to be tried at uh, probably in uh, local level with one or two major centers. Yeah. Look at the results over a period of six months, then only we need, we can move on. Absolutely. And maybe I'll, I'll take this, uh, the plan to what we plan to do offline at, uh, maybe a little later, but uh, this needs to be tested at one or two centers to make sure that it works. And from whatever we have seen so far, I think it is going to work. Okay, got it. Let's see. Since uh, there isn't, uh, I don't see much questions. What exactly is your plan for the next uh, 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 presentation or uh, next lecture so, so that people so, can prepare themselves? Absolutely. So the next presentation I'll talk about, you know, people, if you see an antibodies on uh, any assays, like single antigen assays, people stop transplanting. But uh, we try to uh, cross those antibodies because a lot of patients, um, particularly the pediatric patients, they, they get like a three, four kidney transplantation in their lifetime. So they are highly, highly sensitized patients. So we have 5% of our wait list are 100% CTRs. They, they never get any transplantations. So uh, I, I think the part of the problem is the single antigen assay. So it is so sensitive, we list a lot of unwanted or unnecessary uh, antigen as awards. So we try to understand the clinical impact of each HLA antibodies. Uh, so not all antibodies are same. So the C locus antibodies doesn't bind to the cells, some of them, not all. Uh, so we identified them and we tease out. So, so we transplanted crossing C locus antibodies. We ignore all the DP antibodies, doesn't matter, even it binds to the cells causing positive cross match, we transplant them and the kidneys survive fine. So we are going to, I'm going to talk about how we cross these antibodies, how we cross C locus antibodies, DP antibodies, allele specific antibodies, or any other antibodies that stop the transplantation. Great. There's another question coming up from Dr. Kuneet. 
can you please comment on non classical hla and its importance in rejection uh yes people uh people talk about uh, but uh, non classical hlas doesn't express on all uh cell systems particularly the graft um, uh, the kidney heart lung anywhere they don't express non classical uh, molecules it's non classical express on tropoblast or the thymus uh, you know, so so that's why it is not not critical and also not polymorphic uh, because they are not they don't uh, present viral peptides to the CD8 positive T cell T cell. So that's why it remain very non polymorphic. So so generally it is it is presumably the donor and recipient having same non classical class one, and because it's not expressed on the allograph, it is not matter. So we don't I, type that. I them. suppose that answers uh, Dr. Puneet. And there is uh, Dr. Arjun, about what MFI values do you consider there is significant chance of rejection? Um, okay, I'll leave it to you. I thought I saw something in your presentation. I, yeah, so it, it depends on the antibodies, like a C locus, 20,000 MFI doesn't bind to the cells that means it is not causing the rejection that's what the next my next uh, lecture is how we see these antibodies um, how we transplant them so uh, so it, it is is not your global cutoff 5000 mfi don't transplant no so some antibodies 20000 mfi okay to transplant some antibodies 500 mfi like we talked about bw6 500 mfi don't transplant because the patient is already have that capacity of producing memory response. Thank you. Okay, if there are no more questions, I don't see anything more. Thanks, uh, Professor Rajalingam. And uh, we will meet again on Tuesday that will be 23rd at 7 30 pm and i Thank hope you, to receive from you uh, these uh, contents for the my next uh, information that's to be mailed absolutely thank you very much thank you sir thanks, uh, thanks, thanks for everyone for making the time thank you bye bye